Welcome to Business as Unusual. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. So if you have a question throughout today's live stream, please add them to the chat and we'll try to get to all of them throughout today's session. So I'm going to start with a story, um, a big picture story. Imagine this. You're an entrepreneur, Alex, and you've struck gold with an idea that promises to revolutionize how we approach environmental sustainability. It's an app and it's called Greenprint, and it's designed to minimize our carbon footprint by making small, impactful changes in our daily lives. However, amidst the digital noise and everyday distractions, even the most brilliant innovations can fade into oblivion without a sound go-to-market strategy, or as we call it at Red Caffeine, a grow-to-market strategy. That's the situation Alex found himself entangled in. It's a common thread amongst many business runners. How could Alex have identified and engaged his niche audience, the environmentally conscious tech savvy community? How should he have positioned Greenprint amidst the uh, other competitors in the market? And what pricing model would have struck the right chord? Most importantly, through what channels would he have his app best reach the screens of those making and seeking a greener tomorrow. As everyone on this call or this session can attest, we hear the same statement all the time. We're a great company, but we're a bit of a well-kept secret. And this is not coming from startup businesses. These are businesses that are 50 to 150 plus million in revenues and have, may, have been around for 10, 25, or even 50 years. The truth is getting a product or service into the market or a new market is very complex in itself. Then continuing to grow the business with the other dynamics that we as leaders face today around talent and technology and operational investments is why organizations really need a plan that aligns all the company's stakeholders behind one vision, one mission, and one plan. These are the kinds of things that we, challenges, opportunities that we help our clients solve every day. Grow to market planning, it's a strategic blueprint that outlines how a company will launch products or services to its uh, target market, effectively engaging and acquiring customers. It encompasses, it encompasses various elements that include market analysis, defining customer personas, competitive positioning and channel strategies. And it's all really aimed at achieving successful market penetration and revenue goals. Grow to market planning takes that to the next level by thinking more holistically about an entire company, the people, the tools, the technology, and the processes that you need to get to your growth objectives. So what better time than now, a few months before the start of the year to think about this that being said, grow to market planning isn't just for you know, the start of a new year. You can really do this type of thinking um, at any time during the year. So today we have a few of our red caffeine experts to take us through how to get started. I'm Kathy Seal. I am CEO and founder at Red Caffeine, and I have had the pleasure of building and executing an array of grow to market strategies over my career. But I'm th thrilled today to have some of our RC team members introduce themselves as we jump in to today's topic. So Amy Anderson, would you kick us off? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. I am VP of Client Services at Red Caffeine. My industry experience ranges from the CPG world to financial services to higher education and manufacturing. I love planning season, whether it be the start of a new year or the start of a new relationship with a new client. It's such a wonderful time of reflection of what's been accomplished and a time of, an, of excitement for what's coming next. Uh, I also love helping clients with acquisition integrations, developing lead gen and lead nurture campaigns. So really all the different pieces that make up our grow to market strategies. Christiana? Yes. Hi, I'm Christiana Henry. I'm an account director here at Red Caffeine. I've spent most of my career in the digital marketing and branding space for both large and boutique agencies. And here at Red Caffeine, I love integrating my background with our strategic planning and business growth approach for my clients. Um, I've worked with my clients on a range of goals, including market expansions, like new geographies, new services, or new audiences, 
rebranding both for the external side and their employee side and sales enablement and optimizing digital presences. And last but not least at all, Bill. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Skaronsky. I'm the Senior Content Marketing Manager here at Red Caffeine. I've actually worked in marketing communications branding roles for 15 years or so now, and, and I've always focused on helping companies think a little bit differently about the best ways to grow their business. Uh, my career actually started uh, back in journalism, and then I worked in a number of nonprofit organizations. So I'm personally most interested in helping clients go to market with a really compelling narrative, a story that helps them stand out and, and otherwise see of sameness, like you mentioned, Kathy. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here today and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, this is definitely one of the most exciting and fun parts of what we do with organizations. And so we're going to start really, I mean, this is a big process as you can imagine, but we're going to try and make it a little bit more simplified. And we're going to start by talking um, about the type of the eight types of questions that we really that really drive our, our planning. So if we can kick it off with you, Amy. Sure. We want to go to the first slide. Oh, one of the first things we do is we really like to take that 30,000 foot view of the business. This is supposed to be a little bit more on the objective side, but really think about what's working. So some questions that are helpful and kind of take as thought starters to, well, how do I answer what's working? Well, if you think about what is going well across the business, where are you seeing and feeling success? What campaigns or channels are generating the most sales qualified leads? Or what products and services are generating the most consistent revenue? We can also take it in a different way, too, of what internal processes or technology are most helpful? How are these things contributing to what you feel is working well? In terms of what's challenging on the flip side, what issues are you facing across the business? What isn't working how you expected or need it to be? What problems need to be solved? And you can think about these things across people, processes, tools, sales, partnerships, you know, the full range, you know, internal employees, but really picking apart what are the things that are working and what's challenging. We've prepared a few examples on each of these things, too, just to give you some further insight into how to talk about these things or the types of things to think about. So, Christiana, do you want to share a few examples of like in that what's working realm, some of the types of things you hear? Yeah, I'd love to. So I'm thinking recently about um, some of my clients for whom we've recently launched new websites that are now moving their customers and visitors through new user experience paths that we created to generate conversions. And this was not something that was happening previously, but they're, they started wanting to think about planning for conversions like downloads, landing pages, or even reservation systems and other sorts of technology applications that they wanted integrated. Um, and qualified leads. So seeing those through the top of funnel tracking, like lead feeder or chat. So um, thinking about how your website can really play into your overall plan. Um, we've also had a few engagements recently that were working really well when um, we were working with the sales team and giving them time to focus on top prospects. We've seen it work to automate email quote follow-ups, customer satisfaction, um, an order experience surveys, and even re-engaging with lapsed customers via things like their CRM platforms. Um, the final thing I want to say about what, you know, when you're thinking about what's working is, you know, planning for multi-channel marketing campaigns can work very well for clients who need to reach audiences across a few different spaces or for general brand awareness. Like um, thinking recently of one of my clients who needed to promote their offerings across five different geographies. And so um, how the right channels would reach their audiences in those right areas. 
Great. Thank you. And then on the flip side, it's really important to think about what are those challenges. So some recent challenges that I've been a part of those conversations, uh, one client recently made an acquisition and the integration is proving to be challenging. So we're starting conversations around what does that mean? What could go into the plan now and next year that's going to help smooth out that integration? Um, you know, Looking at things like employee satisfaction and the effect it's had on culture culture or the effect of market awareness and, and how the companies coming together will go to the marketplace as one entity or even internally operations wise, how will those all of the different tools and technology come together in a way that works for both sets of companies. Um, another challenge that we're helping a client with now is they want to restructure their sales from channel partners and go direct. So we're in conversations around adding an e-commerce you know, way of doing business to their company and to their website. And then other challenges I've heard recently range from... You know, one client is doing a great job retaining current customers, but they're order those, these customers are ordering smaller quantities. So we're going to dig in and find out what's going there. Or, you know, we've recently had a client say that their technology is in the dinosaur era. You know, so what can we do to really help get them up to speed and with all of their technology? Yeah, these are really big, meaty problems and challenges. So, you know, exciting opportunities to help level these organizations up. So let's take the, it to the next question, Amy. What, what would be the second place that we then dig, start to dig in? Sure. So those first sets of questions are a little bit more rational and objective, and you're using data and really understanding what's working and what's challenging. And the second set of questions is a little bit more emotional. It's a little bit more, you know, the feeling space of what are you excited about? And then what's keeping you up at night? You know, what are those almost intangibles that we need to uncover and talk about and make sure that we have a plan to address. So on the excitement side, you know, what are you looking forward to? What is the team excited to make happen? You know, being able to have those projects and have those things where everybody is bought in is really important or just something that you cannot wait to get to the market. Um, you know, what is going to have the biggest impact on your business? And this could be something you're excited about, or this could be something that's keeping you up at night. But there's a lot of factors at play that should be thought about as you're thinking about what your next set plans are going to be. And then on the other side, you know, what are you anxious about? What internal and external barriers are preventing your growth? What are those things that, okay, fine, they might not actually keep you up at night, but you have that niggle, you have that, oh, you know, I'm hearing about this competitor or I'm hearing about this coming into the marketplace. We need to address this. We need to have a real conversation about it. So this is a little bit more on that emotional side of figuring out what you need to do next. So Bill, you want to share some examples about what you've heard clients being excited about? Yeah, I, I can't get the image of a dinosaur using a computer out of my head. Though. <laughs> I can't picture a T-Rex going on a keyboard. Uh, no, I'll, I'll go, go go to an example that we just heard this morning. A really excited client talking about the growth of their industry. And it, it gave me the sense that there are a lot of companies now who are really moving out of this pandemic slash recession survival mode. And they're really being much more proactive about moving into a growth mode, which is great to see. Now, whether that means... They're launching new products or new services, or they're looking into adding additional capabilities. Uh, they're certainly investing in people and in, in technology, uh, or as, as Amy, as you mentioned, through mergers and acquisitions. We're seeing a lot of companies adding capacity and expanding locations or going into new markets where I think they've been really hesitant to do that the last couple of years. So I, I think a lot of companies are, are really getting more excited about solving these foundational issues that have been holding their growth back the last couple of years and pouring some gas on the fires where they're seeing opportunity. So personally, that's what I'm seeing. And I'm really excited for those companies too. 
Awesome examples. Um, on the flip side of some things that we've been hearing that's, you know, keeping people up at night is that economic instability, right? There's the positive side of what's happening in the world, but then there's also the scary side. You know, what do the economic downturns mean? mean? Um, you know, how can this everything that's going on affect business profitability and sustainability overall. Um, we've also had a lot of conversations around digital transformation and people realizing that they can't keep doing things the way they've always been doing with the advances in technology, the need for data and how many more decisions are being made by the right kind of data. You know, those types of Changes can require significant investment and change management. So how are they going to make that happen? Um, another area is workforce dynamics. You know, with the rise of remote work, the gig economy, changing employee expectations, managing and retaining the right kind of talent becomes a lot more challenging. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I think because of the way we look holistically, you know, beyond just sales initiatives and marketing initiatives, it really gives us that, you know, bigger picture thinking. Um, there's so many integrated ways that these things touch each other. Technology touches sales and marketing as well as talent and acquisition. So, you know, really being able to have these very big open ended conversations just helps us kind of hone in on what are, you know, focus areas for a, an upcoming year or an upcoming plan, um, but not, you know, making it so narrowly focused on just one objective. So take us to the next set of questions. I think, Christiana, you're going to yeah, jump in here. I am. And so while Amy walked through questions one and two, which are really about looking inside the business and, and thinking about, you know, um, where you're at as an organization. Uh, the next set of questions is really about looking outside of the business and thinking about having some of that external perspective. So question three here is really about what's changed in the marketplace. Some questions that you would want to ask yourself are, there new any, are there any new competitors? What are new products and services that are out there? What new technology can you be implementing that has been launched? Is anyone doing things differently? What do you wish you had thought of first? Uh, what are your customers or prospects asking for or reacting to? Um, some examples of this might be, you know, you've got new competitors who've entered, who've entered the market or um, a manufacturer that we distribute product for has changed what it means to be a preferred distributor. And so now they're having to revise their plan um, so that they can meet those new criteria. Um, we spend a lot of time replying to customers and prospects who want to know if, you know, we have certain parts in stock. I'm hearing this from uh, several of my clients and they want to know how to restructure or allocate their team differently so that they can address aftermarket parts of their business or um, areas of the business which unexpectedly grew this year to keep up with what's happening in the marketplace. Um, Kathy, I'd love for you to share a couple of examples here sure. too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think um, we've also hear people wanting to um, to really, you know, their customers are asking questions about their performance in a an industry that is like theirs. So, like being able to showcase things that um, they've done, you know, in marketplaces and, and, and be able to show that that successful path. Um, another thing that has been happening quite a bit is vendor consolidation initiatives. So, you know, larger enterprise organizations looking to streamline their buying process, you know, through one-stop shop experiences. So how, how do you strategically combine your offering, whether it's through an acquisition or merger with someone else or form some, some good, you know, marketplace strategies with partners that are also selling into the same sector so you could really provide that end-to-end -end experience for, for your customers. And then I think we've touched on this, you know, throughout some of the things, technology is a huge hot button. So what, you know, what else can we do in terms of our business, in terms of getting more access to sales data? You know, how can we automate some of the processes because we've got a leaner team and we're trying to do way more with less? And then, you know, 
how are we looking at productivity and performance metrics? You know, really understanding how to incrementally and you know even beyond incremental improvements in um, our ability to perform and serve our customers by using technology and in, in certain aspects of the of, of our business processes. Awesome, thank you, Kathy. Um, if we want to go to question number four, please. So this is where we really want to think about what's next. You've taken the inputs that you've gathered from your first three questions and you want to apply it to what's coming um, in the next chapter for your organization. So questions to ask yourself, what do you want to accomplish in the next year and longer term? What are your three to five business goals for next year? And, you know, we like to think of... Um, smart goals here. So smart meaning specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound, really making sure that you're holding yourself accountable to those, um, to those data points and, and having some action around your goals. What do you want to keep doing that you've started? Or what is something new that you want to be able to tackle? Given all of the inputs that you've gathered with the first three questions, and then how will you tell your story? How will you go out to your audiences and to your different geographies and, and different marketplace areas? Bill, I'd love if you could share some client examples here. Yeah, I've got one that raises to the top of mind. It's the current for us, um, a couple of us are working on this account, but it's a company that wants to expand into new markets, which we've talked quite a bit about already. But at the same time, uh, they've got some issues that they have to address regarding brand awareness in these areas. Uh, they certainly aren't as well known in certain geographies as they are uh, in, in their home uh, geography. They also have some, some pretty high internal turnover from a staffing standpoint. And in certain parts, pockets of the company, there's pretty low morale. So before they go into a new market or before they consider growth through acquisitions or mergers, they really have to consider these foundations foundational challenges that they have. Otherwise, anything that they do going into a new market is, is going to fall flat. So what we're suggesting they do in terms of thinking about what's next is to actually look at the more foundational positioning for their brand and making sure that they have a really intentional talent strategy so that whatever comes next, uh, sometimes it's less tactical than, than they'd like it to be, but certainly more strategic. And these initiatives like market research and stakeholder interviews are the things that are going to set you up for success when you do decide exactly what's next and which direction you want to aim, whether it's 2024 or for the next three to five years. Uh, so that, that's one example that I think really speaks to the importance of taking a step back and not being uh, as aggressive to, to pursue a new opportunity until you've set the foundation for that, that fertile growth environment. I'm so glad. You yeah. Oh, sorry, Kathy. Go ahead. I just want to jump in here because it brings to mind something that I, I know Amy uh, and a piece of business that she works on. You know, because we've set the foundation so well for certain organizations, when there has been a, a change or an opportunity comes up, we can use that blueprint to take advantage of those types of things. So, you know, there's there's a lot of value in shoring up the you know the existing issues that are going on within an organization because as opportunities arise or you are going to go into a new market you're just so much better set up for success in those situations yeah absolutely well i think well put and we should move on to question number five did you want to share um there was a one other example that you were going to share around an employee recognition yeah yeah happy to that. share yeah happy to share that one so um for this uh for this example um i was thinking about one of my manufacturing clients that was focused on training its managers to train other employees as part of their retention and recognition efforts and they felt that by giving their managers and employees um that complete the voluntary training, some on the spot recognition that it could motivate the rest of the team um, and keep them engaged in the business. So, you know, as much as you're thinking externally about your plans and what comes next, it's important to think internally as well. And, you know, even adding on to the example that Bill shared, I, you know, here again, the recommendations are 
partially going to be about how you recognize your employees to um, help some of that low internal morale that they're experiencing. We're thinking about structuring the employees in a different way to service some of those new markets and experience some of that growth they're looking at. So I would um, urge you to think about what's next for your employees as much as you're thinking about that for your clients. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we've seen a little bit of like taking the foot off the gas in terms of the aggressive hiring that we've experienced over the last few years and, and everybody's, you know, um, appetite for making sure they're fully staffed because that has definitely been a competitive advantage for a lot of organizations to have the right people to deliver. Um, even though, you know, we've seen some layoffs in the last year or so, I, I do still feel like this talent situation is never going to go away. There's just completely vacant areas in our economy where people are not entering the workforce. Um, so, you know, being able to take a little bit of a breath and look internally and shore up those things, I think is, is, a, is a really huge opportunity for organizations right now. Yeah. So Bill, why don't we, we take it on to question five? Yeah, this this really turns it fully out we're outward looking when we think about long term planning. Everyone wants to know how how can we reach the target audience that we need, whether that's people that we want to buy our product or services or our customers, or Kathy, as you were just mentioning, that the top talent in our industry. How is it that we're most likely to reach them? And it's not a new question by any means. It's certainly a a very long standing question that. Uh, that uh, historically has been answered in a variety of ways. Now, the short answer from from my perspective, at least in my experience as a, a content marketing manager is that it's through audience centric content. Now, that, of course, requires us again to take a step back and say, if we want to effectively reach our audience, we really have to understand not only who they are, but uh, what it is that motivates them to take action. And that does require some research. It requires building effective personas and understanding from the customer side what their buying journey looks like. So once we have got all that information, then of course, you know, we've got to make sure that we have an integrated multi-channel distribution strategy to get the right message in front of the right people at the right time. Now, historically, by, by now, we all should know, we should be aware of exactly how easy it can be to reach out to customers, yet at the same time, how hard it is to engage them and move them from awareness to action. Uh, when we talk to, to companies at this time of year or when they uh, have turned over their fiscal year, uh, we're talking about planning for the long term. And I see a lot of them living in what I would describe as this marketing chaos. They're, they're constantly pressuring themselves to create something, create anything as long as it's new whether it's a blog or social media posts, email newsletters, new ads, et cetera, every single month, because that's what they've done for 15 years. And they're terrified to stop. They're terrified to take their foot off the gas. But the problem is that they're also, more often than not, thinking about content from a very self-centered publisher's perspective, in which they assume that everything that they've done before has been seen, Everything they've created and everything they've published has already been seen. People are tired of that. And that for some reason, there's demand for that elusive next piece of content. But if we look at engagement rates across, again, email, social media, advertising, these are really, really low numbers. So as I mentioned above, we can't really lean on historical data to say uh, that, that we can keep putting out the same quality of content and we're going to keep reaching our target audience. The truth is most people don't see the stuff that we put out there. Overwhelmingly, most people do not see what's been created. So that amount of time and those resources that we've historically invested in reaching our customers is no longer justifiable if we're using a manual workflow. And by that, I mean, if we're not using tools like artificial intelligence, or if we're not using some sort of structured framework that makes us more efficient. So the, the, the conclusion to that answer would be that the best way, I believe, to, to reach and to engage and ultimately convert our audience is to get to know them as well as possible, to understand what motivates them, how do they make a purchase, and then only commit our resources to the channels that our data tells us customers use when they're looking for the solutions that we provide. 
that at the end of the day is the best way I think that we can effectively continue to reach our audience consistently. Yeah, and I absolutely. Oh, if I could just chime in, I would say, you know, one of the best ways as you're thinking about getting to know your audience's best is asking yourself some of these questions that were um, suggesting here. So really wanting to think about what motivates your customers and how they move through your buying process, thinking about what your data tells you and looking at that big story so that to Bill's point, you can evaluate which of those content pieces will really reach them. Or what can you um, resurface? You know, do you have your buyer personas defined or have they been updated recently so that you're thinking truly about what your audience looks like now, given marketplace changes or given a change in your goals? Um, and then are you willing to commit to doing something for an entire year? I think we see lots of our clients who try something and it doesn't work the first time. And so they want to stop, but really consistency is key in giving something a chance to really play out and build some of that um, trend in data. You know, I think um, one of my clients that I, that keeps coming to mind as I think about really using the data to inform their planning decisions is, um, uh, one of my food service clients who felt really confident in their audience that they had for both their restaurant and their lounge spaces. But after we evaluated their website data, we found that their audience is in fact three different personas for each of those spaces. So six total personas that they had not even considered. And so we were able to plan for them and start aiming that messaging to them and thinking about what channels would reach them best and what, you know, to Bill's point, what content would reach them best. So, um, you know, want to make sure that you're really considering how you're getting to know your clients through these questions. And then um, once you have those answers, thinking about how you get out, you know, to those audiences best. Yeah, I think, you know, Christiana uh, or, and Bill, maybe you could touch on this. We also are working with leaner resources. Mm -hmm. So our, our teams are smaller. So they're, how are we using certain tactics on from some client examples to extend the way we've done it in person? Can you speak to some of those examples, Bill? I think you had. Yeah, we've, we've got a couple of clients that were really changing the way, for example, uh, organic social media has always somewhat been seen as a page company page out organic distribution and then there's a whole nother side of it in which people like you and i are posting on a day-to-day -day basis so what we've done with one of our clients recently is shifted the amount of time that's spent on just creating company content that comes from the organization and goes out on a monthly basis and looking more at how we can help their senior leadership engage on a one-to-one -one level whether that's directly through new customers, through a direct message campaign to say in, in a very personal way, hey, we've got data that says you just bought for the first time from us. I just want to personally welcome you to the company and show that we're, we're a very customer centric organization. You can reach out to me directly anytime that you want to. Um, also, we have the opportunity then to help those senior leaders craft very compelling content because they have the networks. They have the connections from top to top in an organization. Unfortunately, what they don't have is a lot of time to create new content and to think through, geez, what am I going to say six months from now? I, I can't even think of what I'm going to do six days from now. I'm just too busy. So mm -hmm. by building a, a framework that's very topical and always relevant, which I'll, I'll get into in a few minutes, uh, we can help leaders map out their own personal content strategy on social media or through events or through uh, email engagement. Uh, it's a way that we've been able to increase engagement rates and help companies in an area in which they're, they're, they're struggling to help themselves because of the lack of resources. Yeah, thank you so much. That's that's great. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to question number six. Yeah, I think if question number five mm -hmm. is, is how do we reach uh, the audiences that we want to in the best way possible, uh, it sets up the conversation we just had, but, but the next logical question is, what if things change throughout the year? Like, how do we commit to a long-term plan for reaching our target audience, knowing that uh, things six months from now might be different than they are uh, today as we look at that plan? So 
unfortunately, that's, that's one of my favorite, and I would say the most impactful things that, that I get to do here at Red Caffeine is working with clients on, on long-term planning like this from specifically from a marketing perspective. And what, what I enjoy doing is taking a company from very tactical uh, monthly <clears throat> campaign mindset in which they're, they're asking themselves, geez, what are we going to talk about this month? What's that next email newsletter going to be about? We've got all this space on the calendar to fill. What are we going to do next? And moving them into a mindset eventually that says, we know exactly what we're going to address every month of the next year. Each of those topics is aligned with our company goals. And it's based on what we know that our audience wants to hear. Again, because we've done the research. Um, and those companies are saying we're existing are leveraging it. We're leveraging our existing assets instead of creating new constantly and changing, um, changing our focus from continually putting the pressure on ourselves to publish and create and edit and looking more at the library of resources that we already have available that we can just better distribute. And what they're seeing is that um, now they actually can spend less time reacting and changing direction throughout the year and more time focused on making ongoing improvements to what they've established in the long view is what they really want to be doing throughout the year. Uh, and we do that at, at, at more of a tactical level by helping them focus at the highest level possible on what few, I'd say three to five, what small handful of cornerstone topics will be most relevant to the client year round. And then, as you see in the questions on the screen here, making sure that we think through how can we help customers make better buying decisions in these areas. You know, if, if we start with something like our value proposition or differentiators, uh, if we look at the problems that we solve and the products that we sell, uh, and of course the people that we sell them to, then we can use an artificial intelligence tool, something like ChatGPT, to generate a list of I, I like to go between 25 and 50 questions that buyers of our products really should be asking themselves around our cornerstone topics. And then we have an overlapping piece in what we would call a consider a Venn diagram between what matters most to the company, what matters most to the customers. That overlapping space in the middle is, is the content sweet spot that we should be trying to hit year round. That sweet spot should never be irrelevant whether it's now or March or October of next year, those, those factors should always be important. So what's happening is we're, we're no longer just talking about what we do or the features and benefits of our products. We're actually becoming a valuable resource for our customers. And for anyone who's under pressure to make the right decision, we're shifting the focus from what do we want to tell them to how can we help them? And that's what we, we call a unifying lighthouse statement. What's that one statement throughout the year that's always going to guide what we're doing to help our customers make better buying decisions? Yeah, could you, Christy, uh, Amy, could you share a client example here? So one example is that uh, we just started working with a new client and they have been writing content, blogs, case studies, et cetera, for um, even contributing to articles for a really long time. But the existing content wasn't easily accessible. And to Bill's point earlier, they felt new content was always needed. And so one of the things we were able to do was help align on those cornerstones, you know, what are those buckets or topics that are most important to your customers that you feel are going to be the most helpful to them. And then we've been able to organize all of the content that already exists into these buckets and then help build that long-term plan to be hitting on those cornerstones at key points of the year. But what it also does, exactly to Bill's point, we have a plan, but that that plan gives you the freedom to be flexible then. So when that unexpected thing comes up or something happens in the marketplace that, oh my gosh, we have three articles we've written on this topic. Let's put those out in our emails instead. Let's send that out with our sales proposals. We have different ways that we can utilize the content that already exists to support the baseline cornerstones that mean a lot or to be able to address things that come up and we all know that they do. 
yeah, we, we started doing this in terms of building that type of pillar based framework probably the beginning of last year. And we started working with a, a one client in particular who wanted to focus on four specific differentiators. And they always wanted these very important things to be front and center. They were on their website, but they were buried. And we asked, you know, how can we help people find the content we have available in various corners of our website related to these topics? So what we, what we did is we gathered all of their existing content and we organized it into a library. It's the first step. And then we use that library to build four pillar pages. And those have become really, really valuable SEO rich, a wealth of resources for the customers, uh, also prospects and, and even their own sales team. So what, when we took that pillar approach, we also built an annual content calendar and filled it throughout the entire year with pre-planned email, digital ads, social media, and event focus so that we were constantly driving traffic through these four pillar pages and in a very integrated strategy. We rotate from one pillar to the next uh, throughout the year to make sure that January to December, everyone is covered evenly. But that gives you a wide view of how just taking a very, very structured pillar-based or or cornerstone based approach can help you fill in an entire year's worth of content. And then to Amy's point, when things come up, you still have the flexibility to address them without stopping doing what you were doing because you can no longer be in two places at once. So the more time I think you put in in advance in a long-term planning process like this, the more efficient you can be later in, in, in the year and the less time you actually have to spend putting out fires and, and chasing month to month uh, production. It, it also calls out gaps. You know, maybe you're an organization that you don't have this huge library of content, right? But if you can align on what those cornerstones are, what are those unique differentiators? What are those most relevant things that you need to say that are going to make an impact in the market? Then you go and create that content around it too. So it's a nice way of, you know, understanding where the gaps are as well, which will then help you put into place in the plan what you might need to create new as well. Yeah, and I want to make sure that we don't um, over underplay the value this is for sales teams. Um, being able to point to success, being able to point to subject matter expertise, being able to invite somebody to a webinar or something that you know is a softer approach to educating your audience and making and building those relationships are you know really really key pieces to the sales process so this is, shouldn't just be on your website this should be integrated in how the, the sales and marketing teams are really working together to scale the growth strategy so let's move on to question number seven um this is you know where the rubber meets the road so yeah it's one of my Favorite and least favorite questions, to be honest. <laughs> when, when we're talking about defining our success, I, I think historically we've looked at, we, we've looked for, I should say, hard numbers. We, we've looked for return on investment. Uh, we're, we're trying to understand what do the numbers tell us? And in the past, if the numbers didn't look good right away, it felt like, well, this isn't working and it's not going to work. So we're not going to continue putting resources into these areas. And now, unfortunately, we have more access to data than we've ever had before. So it's become much easier to say, well, we have sheets and sheets and sheets of data. Um, some is good, some is not good, uh, but we're kind of stuck. So I, I think the question is really two questions. First, from a quantitative standpoint, are we measuring what really matters? Are we looking at things that actually have tangible benefits? And the way I qualify that question is by saying, if this data told you something in one extreme or another, would it change your behavior? And if the data would not change your behavior, then it's probably not the right thing to be measuring. Because if you're not going to respond to the data by doing something differently, then it's probably a vanity metric of some sort. And the second question in, in this process is, what can we do to qualify improvements that can't easily be measured? And that's, that's almost a bigger challenge because things that we're doing, whether they're related to internal processes or um, external brand focus, aren't, aren't always very easy to measure. 
we know that they're the right thing to do. We know that they're going to make everything else we do better, but they're not very easy to put our thumb on. Um, so we, one, one example that we, uh, again, within the last 18 months or so, we changed the way that we run quarterly business reviews for our clients uh, in order to deliver more value to them. Uh, instead of overwhelming them with, uh, let's say, 100 slides or graphs or charts, uh, Google Analytics, uh, we simplified the process around three questions. Uh, what happened? How should you feel about it? And what are we going to do about it? That really changes the conversation. We're, we're still gathering the same data, but as growth consultants, our responsibility is really to synthesize the information and to turn that into actionable insights for our clients. Uh, for me, uh, defining success is as much about what happened in the past as it is about what we can learn about it and how we can do better in the future. So that's why I've been working for years to shift people from being so obsessed with return on investment and thinking more about return on improvement. How can you become better based on the data that you're gathering to set yourself up for future success? So don't wait until the campaign's over to measure. Uh, usually you know, think about what you've already measured to determine where your next campaign should be and how you move forward into uh, the next 12 months. Yes, Bill, on that point, I'm thinking about one of our shared clients that we um, analyzed that for very recently where we were looking at their campaign data and seeing that the engagement was really dropping off after the first email. And so we needed mm -hmm. to change not only that messaging, but how many emails were going out or the structure of that campaign. So. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. And, it, you know, to me, it really brings up this idea that um, we've touched on a few different times, which is it doesn't, data doesn't happen just once and you don't measure the success of something just once, but also planning for and making amendments to your plan, you know, happens all throughout the year. Um, yeah, that's I, so indicative of growth in general. Like you, you don't grow once. If you're not right. continually assessing what's happening, you stop growing. And so you, yeah. you have to push, you have to pressure yourself to define success as the ability to keep growing year after year, yeah. not resting on what you did last year. Yeah. And I, I want to share some examples of what KPIs people could look at for measurement, because I think, you know, our audience might be asking themselves, well, what counts as data and, and what can I look at? So, you know, things like your sales goals. Um, and how you're tracking against those sales goals is a really valuable data set. How are how are customers responding um, to your sales efforts? Uh, thinking about you know what quotes you're providing to a particular sector, um, a net promoter score or a customer satisfaction score, and consistency in those annual surveys so that you're looking at tracking your data over time and looking at those trends. Same thing goes for employment satisfaction scores and, and consistency in those annual surveys. Those are really valuable data sets that you can be looking at. Um, you know, you're thinking about also things like the, the stats that you can gather through Google Analytics um, or reports like SEM Rush um, or, uh, you know, other points of measurement. Um, and then last but not least, don't overlook the value in having those third party qualitative surveys to assess trends and feedback. I know, Bill, you yourself are a huge fan of qualitative um, data sets and really digging in deep and how a third party um, you know, consultant or team member can really get to the heart of how clients or employees or certain target audiences are feeling about something. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we've seen it several times recently where a, a client will say, well, we know how people feel, but what we find is that, that whether it's employees or customers, they're much more open when there's a third party asking the questions, they're much more mm -hmm. honest okay. and transparent. And I would argue that they're, they're probably waiting for someone to ask those questions because they want things to change in their own organization or in their own situation. It's just that no one has put them, put those questions to them yet. So yeah, if, even if it's building on the survey data that you've received, there's always an opportunity to dig deeper with one-to-one -one questions and to have an objective third party do it. Otherwise, um, you know, customers are likely to tell you uh, what you want to hear. Um, 
but even if you can get a small group of very, very loyal customers who will be honest with you and build a customer advisory board, it's a great way to tap throughout the year. Say we, we're going to talk three times a year. We really want to know what's going on in the buying process, what's changed for you, what we can do better. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, being able to be open and honest in your organization and understanding what people really value, it, it, that can be both customer uh, interviews and employee interviews. I, I think you can't change what you don't know is broken or you can't improve what you don't know is not meeting expectations. So, you know, it, it sometimes is painful to hear that your baby is ugly or what, whatever comes out <laughs> in, in your interview. Um, but, you know, th th that truth can really help you improve. The, yeah. the other thing I just want to say before we kind of close out and move into the, the final and eighth question is just the fact that, you know, it, marketing and, and anything we're doing within a plan, it, it's not set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. What worked six months ago, three years ago, may not be working now. And the more you have it broken out, the easier it is to pinpoint the area that needs to be addressed. So, you know, you might not have had um, the same issue with inbound uh, top of funnel leads three years ago because there was just so much pent up demand uh, as we were in the pandemic. But now it's starting to get a little bit more contracted as the supply chain issues are, are evolving and changing. So, you know, being able to know where you're losing um, steam in the within the entire process is is another thing that we look hard at when we're doing these kind of look backs and look forward evaluations of how uh, an annual plan or grow to market plan is performing. So the last piece is is something you know we want to make sure that we address is that the eighth question is like who do we include in these types of grow to market. Um, initiatives and, and you know, uh, strategic planning exercises. So, you know, for us, we really feel like it starts at the top. Um, getting a group of the C-suite leaders in an organization to sort of set the vision of the short and long-term growth. Uh, we love thinking three, five, ten years out, but really scaling it back to what can be done in, in one year. So you've got sort of the current state, the, you know, the one year like future state, and then maybe a three year future state. And so people that you would want to include in that part of the process would be senior leadership and people on your executive team, the CMO, CEO, marketing officers, a CEO, OO, um, a CFO, uh, somebody that is overseeing their, your hum human capital initiatives really getting un an understanding of the vision of the market and strategic objectives that are going to guide the overall direction for your plan. Amy, what's next? So then there's the actual doing of the campaign and channel planning um, and then the plan execution. But before I list those people who are typically involved, I also want to say it's okay if your company doesn't have all of these people. Um, we work with a lot of different organizations where maybe you do have all of these roles, or maybe you have one person serving one, two, or three of these roles, or maybe you work with an outside agency like a Red Caffeine who helps to fractionally fill some of these roles to you know, keep you moving ahead on these types of things. Um, so in the channel planning and campaign planning, we have our strategists and market research. So these are individuals or teams that are focused on market trends, competitive analysis, customer preferences. They really help provide that data that informs those strategic decisions. Um, also important here are the sales leaders because they understand the practicalities of the market dynamics and customer relationships. They really can provide those deep insights into the sales cycle, the customer objectives objections and effective sales strategies and techniques. 
Um, we also have those marketing leaders. So they're going to be the ones who are really accountable for making the plan and seeing it through. So they help establish those clear and measurable objectives. Um, they're responsible for defining the campaign budget. You know, how is that ROI going to be maximized? Um, additionally, they determine the most effective channels, whether it's in the digital realm, traditional space, you know, based on those target audience habits and integrating those platforms to create that unified campaign strategy. Um, we also see HR involved a lot here, too, because of, you know, all of the different needs that are happening across organizational change or staffing, you know, having human resources input on recruitment, retention, culture, and training can be vital because they're the ones living and breathing it every day. And then I've, we've really yet to meet a plan that didn't need some type of web or technology operations. So, um, you know, to be able to have somebody who can help see that through is going to be important as well. Um, and then honestly, a lot of those same people are involved in the overall execution of it as well. You have your account leader or somebody, you know, your, your marketing manager who's really in having that pivotal role in executing that go-to-market plan. They are acting as that bridge between your company and the customers um, to make sure that all of those different pieces are coming together in the right way. Um, in most cases, there's some type of marketing team, again, whether it's internal or external, um, but they're the ones who are executing the majority of the grow-to-market strategy. So these are your content creators, your SEO specialists, your product marketing managers, your digital marketing specialists, um, possibly even event coordinators, and anyone else who really contributes to those marketing efforts. Uh, the web ops team, you know, really plays that crucial role depending on what those technology needs are. And then again, being able to tap back into HR and actually execute on some of those uh, recruitment and retention plans as well. Yeah, I think, you know, the important thing to note is there is a lot of businesses that feel like they've got a unicorn scenario and that one or two people can serve in all these different positions. So that's, I think, the rise in popularity around fractional, you know, and gig staffing has really been additive because it is a, a very complex market that we are in today. So in terms of thinking about plan performance um, or quarterly business reviews or biannual business reviews, I really think that's the time to back bring back the C-suite, um, you know, organizational leaders back into the fold, be able to make sure that the, you know, they understand that everything's moving towards their objectives and the vision that they had for the business, but also things shift. And if you don't bring those people back into the room and, and hear what's on their minds on a very frequent basis, a few times a year, you might not be meeting the objectives that they had set up or had been talking about at leadership team meetings that the, the rest of the core execution team might not have been a, a part of. So really getting those groups back together to make sure that the plan is tracking um, and that nothing major has shifted in the organization. So that's a lot. And you know, I, I hope um, we've been able to really, you know, provide some constructive thinking and ideas for businesses as they're starting to think about next year. Um, or anytime they're ready to make, you know, a strategic investment in their organization. Uh, as with, as always, we want to make sure that if you have another question or you want to speak directly to any of us, you've got access to us. So we're sharing our LinkedIn um, and our email addresses. Please feel free to reach out. Um, we'd love it if you put business as unusual in the subject line so we know that you listened to today's session and you've got a question to follow up with. Um, so we also, you know, have really a great strong uh, sponsorship through our partners, uh, M3 Learning, um, we have HR Source and Insperity that are some of the key players that help us bring the business as unusual content to you on a monthly basis. And then, you know, I know it's getting close to, to the one o'clock hour, but we want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about 
in November's Business as Unusual. So we took that right, wide approach, but we're going to really talk about events, um, trade shows specifically for 2024. You know, I think there were during the pandemic, um, you know, events marketing and being in person at events really took a, a different turn. And but, you know, our our clients and many of the people in the space are really investing in getting back in front of these one to one situations where they're able to attend these trade shows and have a great trade show experience. So we're going to bring in two uh, really market experts, Kevin Fett from Ion Exhibits and Glenn Ruggiero from On Location to share what they're seeing people invest in and what companies are doing to leverage uh, these trade show experiences um, in 2023 and as like, we move into 2024. So some of the things that you can expect from this session is uh, what you should include in your trade show planning, you know, and how far in advance you should be thinking about any time you're going to be investing and exhibiting at a trade show. Uh, really being honest about what your targeted outcomes should be and what you feel like would be a successful program. And then we're going to share some pre event checklists for, you know, how you can make sure you're prepared for anything in a show. So, you know, pre, during, and post planning, but also like, you know, just on site, what you should really be thinking about having on hand. So, I hope you'll join us. It's going to be a great session. I want to thank our Red Caffeine SMEs. Thank you so much for joining me today. I knew it would go quickly, uh, but I hope everybody got a lot of value from today's session.